Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon uh, for our Asthma Society Love Your Lungs um, conference, uh, for which I'd very much like to thank our sponsors, uh, GSK, who have helped us to make this event possible. Um, so today we have a very interesting and varied uh, session ahead of you that I hope you can stay. Um, and you can forward your questions as you have been already uh, for in very significant numbers uh, through the usual channels here into the society uh, on social media and on the website. Um, so today we're going to cover a number of things. Shortly I'll hand over to Professor Des Cox, a consultant paediatrician um, and an expert in paediatric asthma who will talk about uh, the how and why of asthma management in children. And then we'll hand over, uh, Des will hand over to Ruth Morrow, uh, who will give us some fascinating uh, insights on how to improve the use of medication um, across the board. We'll also then um, have uh, what should be an intriguing uh, insight from a patient advocate, uh, none other than one of our very good friends of society, Alan Kearns. And Alan will talk to us uh, in detail before we get to see um, the story of Rebecca uh, from, uh, and we have a nice video format for uh, Rebecca's uh, uh, story. Um, and that will lead nicely then into uh, our very good friend, uh, Dr. Dermot Nolan, uh, the national lead for uh, asthma and primary care in Ireland, who will talk about how to prescribe an asthma action plan and, and the adherence uh, to that plan. Um, uh, and then we'll be able to uh, field uh, some of these questions that, as I say, are coming in uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to give you some, some of our insights um, as the day goes on. So I might kick off by just talking very briefly about how to recognize when your asthma is not improving. Or the best way for you to know that your asthma is not controlled and that you need to improve your asthma would be uh, by re re referencing your asthma action plan. I hope you have one of these plans. If you don't, you should really try and get your hands on one of these. Um, from your practice nurse, for example, from your respiratory clinic. They can also be downloaded from the Asthma Society website. And in the amber section, the middle section, there's a description of what it is to have uncontrolled asthma. If any one of these things apply to you, such as that your symptoms of cough, wheeze, breathlessness or chest tightness are returning, you're needing to use your reliever blue inhaler more than twice a week, or more than once a week in the case of a child under six. If you're actually missing days from work or other uh, uh, productive uh, things in your life, if your peak flow is starting to drop, for example, or if you feel you're coming down with a chest cold or, or flu-like illness, um, th those can all uh, be triggers uh, to your asthma and a sign that your asthma uh, management needs to be uh, increased. Um, and we will touch on that as, uh, as we talk through the afternoon. And having m more than uh, one flare-up a year requiring steroids is also a sign that your asthma is not well enough controlled. Um, so th you'll see these themes coming back up as we chat a bit further uh, in the course of the next hour and a half or so. Um, so to keep to time, I'm going to um, now uh, hand over and introduce my colleague, uh, Professor Des Cox who is uh, a, a, say, an international expert in paediatric asthma. And Des's insights will be invaluable to us this afternoon on the how and why of asthma management in children. So Des, you can take it from here. Uh, thanks, Marcus, and thanks to the Asthma Society of Ireland for asking me to speak today. It's always a pleasure. Um, so if you just want to start my presentation, it's okay. Thanks. Um, so today I've been asked to talk about the how and the why of asthma management in children. So I suppose I just said I'd start off by giving a couple of uh, slides on what is asthma. You know, I don't, don't need to tell most of the people listening here today what asthma is, but if you want to define it, it's a chronic inflammatory disorder. And the, the main characteristics of the condition are recurrent episodes of cough, wheeze and shortness of breath. In regards to paediatric asthma or asthma in children, which is what all I'm going to be talking about today, really, um, it can occur at any age um, and there's no... Uh, kind of, you know, uh, there's no kind of age bracket where you say you can or cannot diagnose asthma. Um, and uh, the common triggers are um, viruses, exercise, allergens and cold air. By far away, our viruses would be the most common uh, trigger in, in children with asthma. Um, <clears throat> so uh, just moving on to kind of how we diagnose asthma. Really, um, you know, in, in, in uh, asthma in children, very little investigations are needed. And really, it's all about the history and listening to what the parents are telling you in the clinic. And that's really the most important part of the assessment. 
Um, an important question we often ask in clinic is response to treatment. So, um, and that's that's a key uh, in piece of information we get from the from the clinical uh, uh, clinical out appointment, whether or not there has been a positive response to bronchodilators <clears throat> or inhaled corticosteroids over a certain certain time period. <laughs> And often uh, in clinic, we get uh, kids to do lung function, but we can only do, do this over the age of five. And this can be quite helpful <clears throat> with diagnosing and monitoring uh, asthma. So just moving on to the how of how we manage asthma in children. In light of the fact that this is a very short presentation, it's very difficult to me to, to kind of go over all the nitty gritty of, of asthma management. So I'm just gonna go through a few key concepts really, and uh, not a lot has changed in the last uh, 20 years in respect to how we manage asthma in, in regards to, you know, it still comes back to the key points of reviewing and monitoring your asthma symptoms <clears throat> on an ongoing basis. And that really guides our therapy. And um, the commonest reasons uh, for poor asthma control are um, you're either not getting enough of the treatment, so your doctor probably maybe to prescribe more or, or, um, or yeah, an additional medication for that. Probably even more common than that is adherence issues, so not taking the treatment or forgetting to take it from time to time, and then not taking it correctly. <clears throat> this comes back to inhaler technique and, and the use of space or device, which is especially important in childhood asthma. So they're really the commonest things that we would ask, first of all, in clinic is, are you taking it or are you taking it correctly? Uh, asthma education uh, overall, it's not just about inhaler technique, it's also about asthma education, which I think some of the other speakers will touch on, um, but it, it really is paramount uh, into how we manage asthma. So when we do decide to uh, give treatment for asthma, really uh, twice daily inhaled steroids uh, are, are, is, is the cornerstone of asthma management. There are obviously lots of different medications out there, but um, you know research time and time again has demonstrated the the effectiveness and the uh, uh, the the that they that how effective these medications are in preventing. Uh, poorly controlled asthma um, and uh, although obviously there are other therapies which we don't really have time to go into uh, really for a uh, kind of most cases of asthma it can be managed with it with inhaled steroids and the, the thing about uh, inhaled steroids is that in children and especially young children, um, it's not really an option to give uh, inhaled steroids on and off uh, during uh, just during exacerbations. There's no evidence that that just it likes to, uh, taking your medication just when you're unwell, your, your preventer medication when you're well ha has any great effect in childhood. Now, this is obviously different in adult literature <clears throat> and certainly in, in young adults, but um, certainly in younger children, there's no evidence that episodic use of inhaled steroids makes a big difference to your asthma control. So you really do need to be taking it on a continuous basis, um, you know, on an ongoing basis every day. Um, and, uh, you know, a question we often get asked in the clinic is about the side effects of, of inhaled steroids. And, and really, you know, what it comes down to is the risk of uncontrolled asthma is far, far greater than the risk uh, from using inhaled steroids on a regular basis. So in respect to, uh, you know, when we do embark on a treatment plan for asthma, it's really important that we sit down with the parents and the child and set out some goals. Um, communication is, 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 is kind of crucial here so that, we, we, you know, you're, that all the treatments we give for uh, asthma in childhood is not curative. It's based on uh, managing symptoms. Um, obviously, a certain, uh, ch certain amount of children will grow out of the, the condition, um, but, it, but all of these medications that we prescribed don't affect the pathway of the, of the disease. It doesn't tell us what's going to happen down the track or doesn't affect um, what's going to happen in the future. Future. It just manages the symptoms. It's important to to recognise that 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 that's uh, you know what are, what are the goals of your treatment. The next um, thing to do is obviously you know working with families, recognising uh, that they you know that this is a partnership and that it is certainly something that you need to kind of work on. It's not something that um, you know you can just. Just send a, you know, draw up an action plan, just hand it over and then, you know, said, see you later. It's kind of, you do have to kind of engage with them and uh, make sure that they, they uh, empower them to be able to manage their asthma and their child's asthma.
And then, you know, it's important to explain why you're administering treatments and, and what's the rationale for that. And also to answer any parents' questions. Um, you know, so again, communication is is probably a, a, one of the most important uh, aspects of, of managing asthma. So in respect of uh, the common question I also get asked is why do children get asthma? And really, there's no easy answer for this. It's a combination of different uh, different factors. Uh, so uh, a slightly immature or underdeveloped immune system, uh, allergens, um, uh, genetics, um, and then viruses. So it's generally a combination of any or all of these, which uh, kind of in your genes and your environment uh, <clears throat> kind of come together and make up and lead you to have asthma as a child. You know, there are different time points during childhood where you may or may not grow out of it, but um, it's important that, uh, you know, asthma is, is a chronic condition and it should be monitored appropriately uh, with follow-up by your GP or a respiratory physician. And, and just why is it important to manage asthma correctly? So unfortunately, asthma is still a potentially fatal condition. Although it is a rare occurrence in children, it still does occur. And it's important, uh, you know, that, that we recognize that. It's not something that you, you can just uh, ignore. And, you know, it has got, uh, you know, severe consequences. Obviously, from, uh, you know, it, it, you know, and, it, and Marcus had touched this in, this in the very beginning, it's really important that we recognize the patterns and signs of any asthma exacerbations early. And, and that's kind of comes through learning, education and experience. Um, you know, if a child does have poorly controlled asthma, they're more likely to miss out on school, sporting activities, family occasions, things like that. And then it will lead to increased hospitalizations, uh, ED attendances, um, etc. Also, just as a kind of a, a note about, you know, if for childhood uh, asthma, it's really important that, you know, the, the information and the action plans are passed on to the school and the creche and um, that they have the, these uh, these plans available if, if, they, if your child does get sick uh, during school hours. And finally, just about a slight uh, COVID and asthma. Again, this is a common question over the past 12 months that we've been asked to address um, in, you know, in clinics. So. In, again, I'm just speaking about COVID in relation to child, children and childhood asthma. So <clears throat> thankfully, severe COVID-19 is a rare occurrence in children with asthma. And really, age remains the biggest risk factor for, for severe COVID. So we haven't seen large swathes of children with asthma being admitted uh, through the emergency department with COVID-19 over the past 12 months. <clears throat> in fact, we, we haven't see, we've seen a, a dip in asthma admissions over the past 12 months. And when kid, children do come back to clinic, they, they do report that they've noticed a, a decrease in their symptoms. <clears throat> now, that's not across the board. Some people have had, still had very persistent asthma problems, um, but obviously with inf increased infection control measures, mask wearing, and the lack of vi other viruses in circulation, this has significantly decreased uh, asthma exacerbations, uh, the attendances to the hospital. So just in conclusion then, um, I suppose uh, the few points I'd like to kind of highlight would be, you know, in, re in regards to healthcare professionals, you know, listening to parents and taking the history is the most important part of the consultation. Um, ongoing regular review and monitoring of your asthma symptoms is really essential. So whether that's done by your GP, checking in with the asthma nurse or checking in or, or follow-up appointments with a respiratory consultant, it's important that it's, it, you know, it's, it's not left by the wayside. And I suppose during COVID-19, um, this is, uh, you know, now that we're emerging from uh, from lockdown, etc., it is important that you know you do schedule in a, a follow up and, and review appointment with your healthcare practitioner in regard to your asthma. And regular inhaled corticosteroids still may remain the cornerstone of asthma treatment in children. And and finally, as will be touched on again and again today, you know, good inhaler technique and adherence to medications really is essential. So I'd like to thank the Asin Saudi of Ireland for uh, asking me to speak today. And I'd like to pass you on to uh, Ruth Morrow, who's a respiratory uh, nurse specialist in the area of asthma. Thanks. Okay, so the next slide, please. So the first thing I want to talk to you about is controller medication. So these are the most important medications. And I suppose these have been called preventers in the past, um, and there's been different names on them. And basically they are around um, the medication.
was talking about there, your inhaled corticosteroids is the main treatment in this group of medications, and they are the most important ones that you will be taking for your asthma. So the way they work is that they control the swelling and redness in your airways. So that kind of, because that swelling and swelling and the airways is what's causing your symptoms of wheezing and coughing and shortness of breath, and sometimes some chest tightness as well. So again, the important thing about the med, sorry, can you just go back? There's the previous slide. So, as I said, they do control the redness in the airways. They, and one of the most important things is that they are taken every single day and that you take them twice a day. They do take a little bit of time. So when you do start the controller medication, they actually, you know, they won't work straight away. So it's not like your blue inhaler that gives you instant relief. That doesn't happen in this case. So it does take maybe a few days up to a week for them to start working. So you have to be patient with them when you do start taking them and just don't stop them straight away whenever they don't work straight away. So, again, it does build up. And as I said, they are taken twice a day in most instances. Certainly in children, they're always taken twice a day. And then maybe in, with some adults, then they may only be taken once a day. So it depends on the medication that you're on. So if you're unsure about which medication you're on and what you should be taking, so please ask your GP or your practice nurse or your respiratory nurse specialist either. And again, next slide, please. So again, these inhalers, these medications can be either an ordinary meter dose inhaler or they can be a dry powder device. So these are kind of um, some attitudes that are in our survey that we did in relation to steroid inhalers in particular. And, and the good thing about steroid inhalers is that they have been shown now, recent research has shown us that they actually are protecting people against severe COVID. So that's a big advantage. And we have noticed in the last year that because people are at home more and they're obviously more concerned about their asthma, they are actually adhering to their medication more. But as things settle down, you know, it's, it, you need to still your medication. So one of these things is uh, one concern I would get heard about a lot um, is that they don't want patients to become dependent on their medication. You can't actually become on this inhaler, corticosteroid inhaler. So you won't become dependent on it. So please don't stop it in, if you're concerned about that. Another concern I often hear will be I should avoid my medication as soon as possible. So definitely not. Um, your medication should be taken twice a day, every single day, as prescribed by your doctor. And then working in clinical practice, another concern I asked about babies and children and taking their medication, you know, the par parents were concerned. And as Dr. Cox said, you know, there is a big concern about the, about maybe the effect of these inhalers on children's growth and development. Uncontrolled asthma is more than more likely to actually affect your child's growth and development. That should be inhaler as well. So they're perfectly safe to take. And again, if they're prescribed at the right dose, for child, there's no way you, you shouldn't be. Your child should not them on a regular basis. And um, so the next slide, please. So these are your your blue inhalers, which everybody should have should have a blue inhaler. So these obviously are taking deep symptoms. These are the ones you're going to take. You're actually getting wheezy, or you're getting having a coughing in the middle of a fire action or a cold. In my eyes, take more often. That shouldn't really be taking it at all. Certainly, if you're taking it more than twice a week, as I said, you should be getting this checked out by your doctor about why you're taking it twice a week because it's really the case. So, um, the way they work that the reliever medication actually relaxes the muscles around the airways. So, as you can see, it's totally different to the controller medications. It's actually working more on the, the narrowing of the airways and around the muscle around the airways. So there, it's going to um, relax them. They're usually blue in color. And they will open up the airway, making it easier for you to breathe. So again, access to your blue inhaler. So no matter where you're going, whether it's to school or to work, you all should have a blue inhaler with you. It's probably no harm to keep one in your car and, um, you know, use to have it there for an emergency use. And then the last thing, as I said earlier, then we said then that using your inhaler more than twice a week does indicate that your asthma might not be controlled. So again, you need to speak to your healthcare practitioner about that. In the case of a child, if they're using it more than once a week, then they should actually go and um, have their asthma reviewed also as to why. Because, you know, it might be something very simple, like maybe you just need an increase in your steroid inhaler or maybe a bit more education about managing your trigger factors. So the next slide, please. So again, this is just our asthma safety campaign, just to remind people that if you're using more than three reliever inhalers per year, you are at risk of an asthma exacerbation or an acute asthma attack. 
An exacerbation basically is a fancy word for an acute asthma attack or a flare up of your asthma. So anybody's using, whether it's an adult or a child, if you're using more than three inhalers a year, you're, you're increasing your risk. If you're using more than 12 inhalers a year, then you're increasing your risk of an asthma related death and you definitely need to have a health care practitioner about this and making sure that you're getting your, your control. Next slide, please. So just a quick word about spacer devices. So there's a few different spacers on the market. So you have the volumatic, which is the bigger one of the two, and then you have the aero chambers and the baby inhaler spacers. So whether you're an adult or a child, it doesn't matter. If you're actually using a meter dose inhaler, which is the ordinary kind of traditional type inhaler, everybody should be using a spacer with these devices. Using the meter dose inhaler directly into your mouth means that hardly any medication is getting into your lungs. They're extremely difficult to use, so it is advisable that you would actually use a spacer with it. For children over the age of seven or eight, certainly, you know, you can think about maybe, you know, getting an inhaler changed to um, a dry powder device, because most children from the age of eight upwards are well able to use um, a dry powder device, and therefore um, the medication will get into the lungs much better. So anybody really from that age onwards, but again, some older people might be using actually volumatics, and that's fine as well. But the important thing is that if you are using a meter dose inhaler, to always use a spacer with it. Everybody should have a spacer and, and a meter dose inhaler for managing an acute asthma attack. Because again, based on the five-step rule that Marcus was speaking about earlier, the advice is, and the best practice is, is that you would actually use a spacer with your inhaler in that situation, because it would work just as well as a nebulizer in terms of getting medication into your lungs. The next slide, please. So again, inhaler technique, and again, this was alluded to a wee bit earlier. So inhaler technique is paramount. And even as healthcare practitioners, we have to get into the practice of actually checking people's inhaler technique at every single visit. Every time we see somebody that's actually on an inhaler, we should check their technique. If you're not sure whether you're using your inhaler correctly or not, all the inhalers that are on the market in Ireland, the techniques are available on asthma.ie. So if you go onto the um, Asthma Society website and just put in the search button that you want the inhaler technique and all the videos will come up for the different inhalers. So as I say, everything that's on the market in Ireland is actually available there. So if you're not sure, just have it checked because maybe in the current climate, maybe in the last year, you might not have had your asthma reviewed for various reasons. Maybe you didn't want to go to the, the GP um, because of COVID and all that. So again, just double check. And the other thing to remember is, is after we usually show somebody how to use an inhaler, about 20 minutes later, they'll have picked up a bad habit or you know, a poor technique issue with it. So that's why it's so important that you actually kind of have a good review of your inhaler technique on a regular basis. Next slide, please. So taking your medication as prescribed. So there's a few tips here. That one thing is, no matter whatever way your medication has been prescribed for you by your doctor, this is the way you should be taking it. So there's a few tips here in terms of, you know, the, the adherence to medication is always a big issue. You know, people are great when things are in a routine, people get used to taking their medication twice a day, every day, then maybe school holidays kick in. That's a typical example, and I certainly would have seen this in clinical practice a lot, that when the school year is on, there's no issue with taking medication. Everybody takes, every child takes it, you know, twice a day, every day. Then the school holidays kick in and the routine is out the window. And then they might only take it once a day, they might even take it at all. So again, if you're missing your inhaler like a couple of days a week, that's not good practice. So. Few tips then, like things like setting a reminder on your phone to take your medication is probably a good plan. And you know, if the, the alarm was off, you know, that'll remind you to take it. Take your medication at a time that's kind of, you know, you're doing something else. So like you're having your breakfast or your supper, you know, so that's a good time to take your medication. Or if you're, when you're brushing your teeth, it's another good time. So, you know, take your medication and uh, then brush the teeth afterwards. Again, morning and evening time as well. So there are two things that you do twice a day. You know, it's kind of getting into habits and it's forming habits around all of this. Um, always rinse your mouth and throat out after using your medication, particularly the controller medication, because of the steroid in that, sometimes it can cause maybe some hoarseness or some thrush in the mouth. It doesn't happen that often, but it can do. Um, so again, it's just make sure you rinse your mouth out and your throat and spit the water out, don't swallow it, and uh, just do that again after using your medication. So that's probably a good one to do. Actually, brushing your teeth is probably a good idea, you know, a good plan to actually um, kind of get into that habit because you're going to be obviously using do, doing the teeth after you use the inhaler, so that'll get rid of any excess medication that might be there. And then 
the follow your asthma action plan. Again, your medication will be written down on your asthma action plan. So again, keep it on the fridge, keep a copy of it on your phone. It's actually a good thing to do because you don't, you don't always maybe have a bag with you to carry it. So it's a good plan to have it on your phone. Keep it on your fridge for your family members can see it and your friends can see it as well. So it's there. And uh, as I say, follow that, but as I say, the medication will always be written on. And not just your inhaler medication, but if you're on medication for um, hay fever, for example, that will actually be written down in your plan as well. Next slide, please. So if you have any questions about your asthma medication, what can you do? And what, well, obviously, there's a few things you can do. You can talk to your doctor, your GP, your practice nurse, your respiratory nurse specialist or your respiratory consultant. And the next slide, please. And then finally, the last thing that you can do then is if you are, you know, you can call these two numbers. So the asthma advice line is there. So if you want to talk to a respiratory nurse specialist about your asthma, you can give that number a ring, the 1800 44 54 64 number a ring and you can book an appointment to speak to an asthma nurse. Or if you don't want to talk to somebody, you can actually send us a message using the WhatsApp number there, which is 0860590132. And we will get back to you um, as soon as we can with any queries you might have about your asthma. That concludes my part of the presentation this afternoon. Um, my name is Rebecca Houlihan. I, I'm from Port Arlington, County Leash, and I'm 20 years of age. I have had asthma since I was a baby, so I've had it since I was around eight months old in the hospital on NEBS and stuff like that, but they hadn't actually physically diagnosed me till I was two years of age, because that's when they can physically diagnose you. Like when I was 17 going into my into 18, and that's when I kind of noticed a, a big difference, as in my attacks would become, like they, I'd get them more, and I'd be in hospital a lot more, and they'd be worse. My fifth and sixth year were very tough. I in Between the two of them I had missed, around about nine months um, and I was actually in, in hospital a week before my leaving cert before I started. Uh, Covid has affected me asthma wise as in it has made me uh, high risk, more high risk. I have to be way more careful when I go out in public. I suppose you know I, I don't have any chance to let my guard down because if I do I could end up in the hospital. Generally with asthma anyways whether you're severe or not they say to not have like perfumes strong smell and stuff, pets because the hair. What happens with me is sometimes if a strong smell comes across, I start coughing and then the cough then would take the breath away and then I would start to get tight and my airways then would become that bit more swollen if you would call it. And I've learned about my asthma in the last year that it is very sensitive and it doesn't care what I do or where I am to get an attack. It's very uncontrollable um, and it literally takes not it takes is something as simple as me laughing to set off a really bad attack and put me in hospital it's me and my meds in it together against my asthma so yes the whatsapp messaging service is a messaging line for people who for anyone really and um, so basically you can shoot a text if you're ever concerned about anything as in medication wise or if you're sick you don't know what to do or who to go to or even as simple as you know, oh, I'm feeling these symptoms when I go for a COVID test. If you ring the GP, the GP, you might not get an appointment till tomorrow, let's say, you know? And it's so handy to have this free service to text. Don't let your illness define you because at the end of the day, you're yourself. I'm Rebecca, I'm not asthma. So I think I'm, hopefully I'm live and um, I'm, apologies about all the gremlins. I'm not sure what's next. Maybe it's a plague of locusts or something coming in. Uh, but I'm just going to get my presentation up if it's possible. Thank you very much there. So again, thank you to the Asthma Society uh, for organizing this day in interest of great talks, despite the, the gremlins. Um, um, so I'm just, my name is uh, Dermot Dolan. I am a, a GP partner in uh, Tremor Medical Clinic in, 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 down in, in the sunny southeast. Uh, and I'm the uh, HSE National Clinical Advisor for, for asthma. So I have a long-term interest in asthma and again, and it's great to be on the platform with such, with such great colleagues and to thank the, the Asthma Society who are instrumental in all the work that goes on behind the scenes. So I'm just going to flick through, just again, if you, just quick conflicts of interest. Here's, here's Tremor today. Uh, you see a line out at the beach. For those of you planning your, your, your staycation, I think we're going to be staying at, at, at home again this year, just to let you know. I have no, farm, no shares or commercial interest in any of the products I talked about today and have spoken and attended meetings on behalf of most of the pharmaceutical companies um, around Ireland. Um, so 
I suppose just maybe just just a, fla- a little bit of a flavour of the background. We know that so asthma that eighty five percent of this is managed by your GP in primary care. About fifteen, you know, ten to fifteen percent will attend the hospital, but the vast majority of patients are sort of are you know in the, the mild to moderate spectrum of the of the disease, and we know that there's about. 380,000 patients, you know, about 7% of patients over 18, about, you know, 18% of, of kids. Um, and, you know, so it was, and, you know, it's, 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 it's important. It does, uh, it's, it's a, the commonest chronic disease we, we deal with in, in, in primary care. And we've, Ireland, as I say, has the fourth highest uh, incidence of, um, of asthma in the, in, the, in the world. So we're up there, we're world beaters in, in, in asthma. And, and why that is, is probably a, a whole different talk in itself. But as Jed says, a combination of factors, genetics, environment, etc. Um, and whilst we don't want to scare the bejesus out of every patient with asthma in the country, we do know that you know that it is associated. We have unfortunately about fifty to seventy deaths per annum every year in Ireland. Complacency definitely is is, is a factor in this, and we know that most of the deaths are certainly the older age group. But still, having had a, as a practice, we experienced a number of years ago a young a young lady who died of asthma. So it's really brought it home to us how important it is to, to that we take asthma seriously. Uh, that we look after patients, that we avoid um, exacerbations, and and although we think we you know it's, a, it's, a, it's sometimes a, you know an the recent asthma survey showed that a lot of patients and their families and their work friends don't take it seriously. It's responsible for about five thousand admissions per per year to hospital, about twenty thousand A and E visits, and about fifty to seventy thousand GP out of hours visits. Um, so. Patients, particularly in COVID, they want to avoid hospital, they want to avoid care doc and all the stuff like that. And so we're, it's important that we take this as a disease seriously. Um, and we know that about 60 to 70 percent of patients use their blue inhalers every day. You know, and the guidelines are what we want to see is we want to see a move away from the blue inhalers, that patients don't have to use the blue inhalers. And the new guidelines are saying if you're using it more than, you know, twice a month. Uh, or twice a week in kids that you know there's something going wrong and I think that message hasn't really got out there yet and there's something and I think meetings like this and spreading the awareness I think is, is important and it's there's other factors as well it's you know secondary care for asthma is expensive once you start getting into hospital and once your asthma starts getting severe it, the cost of it goes up quite dramatically and there's about 470 million Cost the state of that, and a lot of that is indirect costs. It's missing work. You know, kids will miss ten to twelve days per school per year, which kind of a serious effect on their on their on their overall education. So we have to change. There's something we we're not doing right in this country, and probably worldwide in, in asthma. Uh, and I think if we can, the more message gets out there that asthma needs to be treated and needs to be treated seriously, the better. So. I again, I was asked to talk about about self management, and again, it, it, you know, this is really, really important. And there's a there's a sort of the days of the doctor waving the finger at you, telling you have to what to do, are sort of gone. And I think that's been shown now not to work particularly that well. Um, and and I think what self management is 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 empowering patients back again. It's giving them control of their disease, and if they're bought into the idea of asthma and they bought into the what it is and how they manage themselves, they become better patients, better understanding of it, and better control of their asthma. So it's really, really important. I think the self-management is something that's, that's really important. And you know, it's so it encourages patients' participation in the in their disease and how they manage it. It saves lives. You know, and we looked at the the National Review of, of Asthma Deaths in the UK a number of years ago. One of the a couple of key messages came out, but one is that very few patients had a self management. They did not know what to do. It a self management reduces asthma attacks. How does it do that? Well, we know that asthma doesn't just happen from a minute to minute. It generally builds up over a couple of days where symptoms start to get a little bit worse and gradually, gradually leads up to an attack for the majority of patients. So we have an opportunity to intervene at an earlier stage to you know, nip it in the bud, so to speak, to stop the attack, develop a full-scale asthma attack. We know that it reduces visits to A&E. Um, uh, and reduces visits to out of hours exactly by nipping the attack 
in the bud. And everyone, you know, particularly with, no matter what time of year, but particularly with, with COVID, we know that that's a day of no one wants to end up in, in, in ED. Um, it is, and we talked, I just mentioned cost a few minutes ago, but it is very, very cost effective. It sort of, it saves the state. Um, because as I say, once you stand up in hospital, costs for looking after asthma incre increase. So this is, this is important, uh, that we, that we try to get these idea of the, of the, of the self, of the self management. And I say that patients like it. All the international guidelines that we use the GINA guidelines, uh, but there's other the the nice guidelines in the UK and uh, the, you know all the international guidelines recommend that self management is the key to is the key to uh, to asthma control. Uh, oops, very nice, good. Um, um, so, oops, 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 they go on. So yeah, and here's the sort of the bit of the dilemma. Yet only between five and in some studies up to twenty percent. But we have looked at you know in 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 our practice only about four percent of patients had a self management plan, which is pretty shocking. You know, uh, uh, why isn't every patient with asthma armed with this? I, I, I it's multifactorial. I suspect it's 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 time all pressed for time. You know, in practice, you know, you know, you know it's you know it's it's getting harder. Our practice nurses are, are incredibly busy with a lot of chronic diseases. Maybe they're you know the, the healthcare professionals you know both in the hospital and in primary care are unfamiliar with them. They don't even know that these exist. Um, it's not something I learned about in medical school. It's something you learn about later on. I think there's a fear of the the fear of of almost giving somebody that if something goes wrong then would they be would you be responsible for it you know if they if they if you gave them the wrong advice or etc there's a little bit of fear about that some patients are on complex regimes for their asthma with different types of inhalers uh, and they're not quite sure um, you know the, the healthcare profession may not be exactly sure what to say in 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 a in a, in a self management plan and Sometimes then maybe the doctors, nurses may think it's too difficult for the patients to understand or they don't quite understand it. Uh, and then often we try to use it as, as peak flow meters and yet there's that barrier that the cost of peak flow meters, they may not may, may actually have one. Um, uh, and this is what, a, this is a little peak flow meter and many of you I hope um, have one of these. And these are a, a small little a tool there. They, you can buy, buy, they used to be sell them in the, in the Asthma Society, but since COVID, they can no longer post these out. And I, it's probably the best to get them to maybe source it to your pharmacist. I think they cost about a tenner. Um, and they're a very useful way of tool of managing your asthma. Uh, and what they do is you, you monitor, you blow into that device as hard as you can, morning and evening time, to see how, how, how open your lungs are, so to speak. Um, and what we find is that for many patients, they drop their peak flow before they get a full blown attack, or, or sometimes even before they'll feel wheezy or feel tight or feel that cough, that the, the peak flow often drops a few days beforehand and gives us an opportunity to get in, to do something, to nip the attack in the, in the bud. Um, and um, if, if, if peak flows aren't available or you know, you know, can't be used, we, we use symptoms as well. So we use, so, so once you start to cough, once you start to wheeze, feel short of breath, use your, your blue inhaler, you know, um, increase use of blue inhaler. That's another, still a chance to get in, to make a, an intervention to stop the, developing a full-blown attack. And this is what the, uh, Des had this in his hand, or, or Marcus had this in his hand earlier on, and this is what, it's, it's a little downloadable uh, sheet that can be, uh, that you can take from the Asthma Society of Ireland website. And it's, it's a, a two-page document, um, and it is really useful. And, it, and uh, we're sort of all sort of interested in asthma, we're all doing asthma, but I still get shocked by that patients still may not understand the difference between a reliever and a preventer. Yeah. So I think it's, you know, that's, you know, so we sometimes we, we think that everyone knows everything about blue and brown inhalers, but patients, this is a new world for them. They don't under, understand this. So sometimes even, even for this asthma plan to show, this is your controller and this is your reliever. You know, and you take your controller every day to control your symptoms, to keep your asthma developing and your blue inhaler only when you need it, preferably less than, less than twice a week. They've got general advice on it about, you know, about smoking. You know, about watching your weight, which you're increasingly look at, uh, about diet, about how to avoid avoid attacks. Gives them sort of something 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 to read about. 
And what it, what what the med, uh, research shows is that it is, if it's personal, if it's just you just print it off and give them a sheet of paper with a vague, it doesn't resonate with them. This has to be personalized, has to be John Murphy's, this is my asthma attack. We often get them to take a picture, our nurses get them to take a picture on their phones so that they store there so they know what to know what, what it is, where they can access it easily. And we usually get them to when they come back to the clinic to just show me your asthma plan and revisit it to see is it working or not working. Uh, the second page of it, and this is where we are, is that so it's based on the, the, the traffic light system, the green, all oh, systems go, you're not coughing, you're not wheezy, your asthma is under control, you can function day to day. Reminds them to take their their their, their uh, controller medication, their brown inhaler, whatever it is, twice a day, one puff twice a day. Uh, information is there. Then we're moving into the into the yellow zone. This is where patients are told once you start, once you're at peak, and we've you can see there. I'm, I'm not, not sure how well it projects, but their peak flow between falls between sixty to eighty percent. What their best is. So the best in this gentleman, I think, is five hundred. So once it starts to fall between sixty and eighty percent. We're starting to run into trouble. This is an opportunity to get in. And what do we tell them to do? We tell them, we used to tell them just double up your inhalers. That's probably not enough now. The evidence is that you have to take it four times. So instead of taking one puff, take four puffs in the morning, four puffs in the evening for about, for about seven to 10 days to nip it in the bud and continue to take your, your blue inhaler. Um, and which I'll talk about the, some patients, this may not, for this, some patients, this may not be work. We may have to give them oral steroids to take. And then to the red zone, where, where your peak flow falls below 60%, you know, what to do in, a, in an asthma attack as, as Ruth and a number of people, the five steps, which you can, again, you know, to, you know, can save their life. And that's really important that patients know what to do in, in, in an acute attack. And it's all on the, on the sheet there. Um, the um, oral steroids, and again, we use these quite a bit. And who should get oral steroids? Well, so some of the, it's it's a bit controversial, but generally, if patients are on more than four hundred micrograms of beclomethasone, they may need oral steroids. Quadrupling or four times increase their their steroids, their inhaled steroids may not be enough. I tend to use if these if patients have had severe events in the ta in the past, ended up in in casualty or admitted, or if they had life threatening asthma, they. They do need to understand the regime, what to do, and I, we usually give them, uh, tell them to take six of these, these little delta cord, little red tablets, to take six a day for five days. They don't need to taper it down, take five, four, three, two, one. Those days are sort of gone for the vast majority of patients, but they do need to contact the healthcare professional uh, to arrange an asthma review as soon as possible to start this, to make sure they aren't, there isn't an infection or something else going on with them. Um, and this is pretty, I found this particularly useful for patients. Um, you know, it's a Friday night, you can't get through to care doc, you, you know, uh, but you feel your asthma is getting attacked. And this is certainly made, they can start the steroids, get them in quick and early. And, it, you know, if they, you know, for the patients who quadrupling their steroids doesn't work, this is very, very useful to be, thing to be able to do them, to be able to do. Um, so I suppose there are some areas that can we can we need to improve in, in self management and you know at the moment we only have it in English we'd like it you know we're coming a more multicultural society and I think we need to be culturally aware of other other languages I think we can maybe get better graphics and it make it easier sometimes you know to to you know to to try and work on that I think we have new technologies we've got you know we look at apps and phones with young people so if, you know um, that that they may as opposed to piece of paper there's new cool devices which will tell you, you know, will monitor your, how compliant you are. They may be able to, to, to tell you when to up your medication, et cetera. Um, and I think, and the Aspen Society are very good at this, you know, they, you know, they did this in, in Finland very well with expert, not, not doctors, not nurses, expert patients, you know, so patients, uh, as we've seen earlier in the clip, who suffered asthma, their experience, how they do it, and they talk one to one to patients. I think it's very, very useful. I think we have to educate uh, healthcare professionals, uh, or, you know, about self management, how important it is uh, for for asthma. Um, I think I had. Uh, oh, that's I think that's my side. I just uh, you know the, uh, the, I'm going to give a little plug. The IPCRG uh, meeting starts tomorrow in Dublin. World leaders from all over the world in asthma are going to be uh, in virtually in Croke Park tomorrow. IPCRG.org. If anybody is interested, there is a 
every aspect of, of asthma is covered in that. Um, so that's my spiel, and I'm going to hand back to, to Marcus. Thanks very much, uh, Dermot. Uh, that should be a, a very good meeting as well. The best of luck with it tomorrow. Um, I hope you have fewer uh, uh, glitches than, than unfortunately plagued the, the, the meeting uh, earlier today. Um, apologies to, to both Des and, and to Alan for the um, interruptions to their uh, their talks. Um, so I'm just going to quickly um, summarise the, 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 those excellent uh, presentations that you've seen. Um, I think that you know the key for me uh, from uh, from Professor Des Cox's talk was the importance of um, systematically twice a day giving a symptomatic asthma child their inhaled steroid medication uh, day in day out, and, and not just trying to use it when uh, when symptoms arise, um, which is an understandable temptation for patients who are parents who are worried about side effects. But the dangers of asthma itself far outweigh uh, any harm that's going to be caused by the inhaled medications that we use, and that's the same in adults as well. Um, it was also uh, really uh, in, insightful uh, from Ruth to see uh, the discussion of all the, the pitfalls in, in using uh, your asthma inhaler. So it's so important to become familiar with your own inhaled regime, how to use it correctly, and, and why adhering to it you know, as best one can is so important. Um, and uh, again, Dermot has uh, very elegantly outlined the value of a, a well-written self-management plan and, and that, that it's really important that uh, as, as a patient, um, you know, patients understand how it can help them uh, when used correctly. And that's not something that anybody is, is born with innate knowledge of. It, it really in, it needs a good relationship between the patient and the healthcare provider to, to explain and, and explore how to use uh, the management plan effectively or to quadruple, as we've said, the inhaled steroid dose from a low level at the first sign of symptoms worsening or peak flow worsening, and also uh, the role of oral steroid tablets, tablets that are needed to abort a, a dangerous asthma attack when in the red zone. Most deaths in asthma do not happen in intensive care. They happen in the patient's home because the patient didn't realise, uh, unfortunately, in time how dangerous it was becoming. So th those are, are, are some of the key learnings I'd hope you, you take away from what we've explored so far. And we have time now for uh, for some in interesting questions, I'm sure, and, and the, I'm looking forward to some of the answers as well as uh, I'll try and answer as best I can myself um, some of the questions that come through. Um, so uh, perhaps uh, Sarah might want to uh, come in uh, at this point with, uh, with with some of those questions. Uh, thank you, Marcus. And maybe just initially to say um, uh, our uh, apologies from uh, both um, from Des and specifically Alan has come back to me to to apologise. Um, I know I had discussed with Alan his experience of asthma over the course of the last three years and uh, since he was diagnosed, and he was very keen, I suppose, to convey to you some of his learnings to in the hopes that they will be helpful to yourselves. And um, I'm sorry that because of our our technical gremlins today, we weren't able to do that as well as we had wanted. Um, we've had quite a few questions in from yourselves as, as we're going live through the event and also in advance. Um, we've categorised those, and so we'll take a few of those uh, very initially. And the first ones we'll talk about, um, if it's okay with yourselves, um, are in respect of COVID, because that's something that's um, a fairly substantial, um, I, I suppose, uh, point of concern for you. Um, so one of the questions that has come in um, is from Kay. So um, Kay had the first uh, COVID vaccine and she felt like she was experiencing a fairly substantial um, exacerbation of her um, her asthma um, immediately after that. Um, and so that's something that we might just um, touch on. Um, and I'm going to kick those over, these over to Marcus um, because there's two or three of them for there for him to answer. So that's one piece. And then a question from Margie who said, um, oh, sorry, from Mary who said, uh, Sorry, I have the wrong names in front of me. Um, there's a question from Brian, um, who has written us a long question and very detailed, and I don't want to get into the exact specific um, details of what Brian um, is talking about in terms of his own situation, but essentially he's asking for a little bit more information about um, why asthma um, is not included fully in cohort four. And I think Marcus was going to touch on that, and also um, Dermot is going to touch on that. And that's something we've been hearing a lot about from patients, is you know when they will have access to uh, the coronavirus vaccine and how that's being managed at government level. And that's obviously a point of concern. So we might just touch on those two marks, if that's okay. The first one being um, about um, somebody having a vaccine and feeling like they might have been experiencing an exacerbation afterwards. And the second one being um, about vaccines and how um, people with asthma are getting access to those. 
Yes, so thank you very much for, for these questions. Um, so the, the, the interesting question about the, uh, the symptoms of asthma uh, coinciding with the receipt of the, the vaccine, uh, for, for to the best of my knowledge, for any of the currently approved and available vaccines um, that are uh, administered for, for COVID-19, they do not cause uh, breathlessness episodes um, and, and should not be uh, um, avoided on the basis that they will worsen somehow uh, asthma. Um, and I, I can only surmise and, and, and speculate as to what was happening there, but certainly as a general rule, we try to avoid administering a vaccine when asthma symptoms might be about to get unstable or somebody's having an actual infection. Um, it's, it's generally always best to defer vaccinations until an acute illness has passed. I just wonder, was that an issue? Um, because we're not seeing, for example, anaphylaxis, uh, which can mimic in some way the, the, the symptoms of, of, of uh, wheeze, of asthma, is, is thankfully um, not an issue that we're having to deal with um, in relation to, to the role of vaccine. So I, I would put it down to just incredibly bad luck um, and, and still encourage you to, to get your, your, your next vaccination for the protection against a devastating disease which we certainly a lot of experience of seeing firsthand. I mean, in relation to the, the very sensible uh, and informed question about uh, cohort four, which again, in the uh, initial HSE uh, rollout was for those with very high risk of serious COVID-19 related outcomes, um, you know, age 16 to 69. Um, certainly from our, my point of view and asthma specialists like myself, we would have been very keen to have um, patients with severe asthma across the board, severe asthma included in that, and we lobbied for that. We were asked, um, but what ended up happening is, to the best of my knowledge, is that there was such an, uh, an amount of conditions being highlighted as being deserving of receiving a cohort four status. Uh, those who actually ultimately had to make this decision had some very difficult decisions to make, and have uh, you know left out severe asthma from that from that cohort four and instead included in cohort seven, which is high risk. And you can argue you know, to kingdom come what the difference between high and very high is. Uh, and and uh, you know, the, the unfortunate thing is that there is clear emerging and replicated evidence that patients who have received multiple course of oral steroids in the past year who get COVID-19 have a significantly increased risk of dangerous outcomes, including death caused from COVID-19 compared to, uh, to, to control age match peers. So it's undoubtedly a risk factor for those who have unstable and severe asthma. Um, but we weren't able to get it included uh, in, in this uh, guideline uh, for reasons that are presumably down to trying to balance the, 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 the needs of um, all of the patient groups that were involved against the limited supply of vaccine and the schedule and the timeline. But in, a, in, a, in an ideal situation, we would want it to cross the board. I might hand back to Sarah for, for uh, what the next question was. Uh, thanks, Marcus. So there were two other questions, and, and we might uh, keep, um, uh, back to Dermot, who I know had a, a small input there in terms of um, uh, vaccines and what's happening at GP level. But the, the, in the meantime, there were two other questions relating to COVID. One is from Fidelma, who wants to know about um, whether vitamin D um, is good for asthmatics. And another is from Tammy, who said that she had COVID-19 and she needed hospitalisation for oxygen. Tammy, we hope you're feeling better. Um, she wants to know about how to build up lung strength and your immune system. Maybe, Marcus, you might be able to touch on both of those briefly and then we'll kick on to Dermot uh, for um, I, I know he had a little bit of information there about um, the vaccine rollout that might be of help to people. So just in relation to vitamin D it's, it's a thorny issue it's been around for a long time because undoubtedly there are studies that show low levels of vitamin D in people who have severe asthma and you would automatically think it must be a good thing to give vitamin D then replace it and that that will improve asthma and those studies have been done and the data has been disappointing it has not shown a convincing uh, cause and effect relationship such that uh, international guideline groups are not favoring um, administration of vitamin D as a treatment strategy to improve asthma or severe asthma or exacerbations and it's still an area of ongoing uh, study. Um, the, the issue of uh, what to do after COVID-19 is a thorny one as well and it's uh, it's currently being explored by a lot of research groups around the world. I'd hope we'd have better answers in the months to come but at the moment what I would recommend is that there does seem to be uh, uh, good uh, early reports coming out for, for the concept of pulmonary rehabilitation for people who are recovering from COVID-19 and this is just a strategy of careful building up of exercise and fitness levels uh, to allow patients to better cope with the distressing symptoms of 
you know, post-acute uh, sequelae of COVID-19. That's the jargon name for what's called long COVID uh, to most people, uh, which is this, you know, chest tightness, chest pain, um, you know, this brain fog and fatigue and exhaustion that can kick in four weeks after having had an acute infection, oftentimes in people who weren't in fact hospitalized for the disease. And it's an intriguing uh, condition uh, and, and causing you know devastation at huge levels across society that we uh, desperately need answers for. Um, and yet the the, uh, the studies have not enlightened us thus far, but they are underway. Uh, th thanks, Sarah. I think I'm, I think I'm live here. Just again, just to follow up again, uh, uh, Marcus. I think like. The COVID vaccine, obviously, everyone's scrambling for vaccines at, at the moment. Um, I think two things have changed. Two things I think we're going to watch. I think it's a bit of watch this space. I think we will have more and more asthmatic patients uh, uh, getting offered the vaccine in the next little while. I think one of the problems was we had a there was a supply issue. That was the problem into getting it into practices and getting it into into patients' arms. So uh, we, I think, it was a fear if they said every asthmatic patient. Uh, it would cause such a you know scramble for vaccines that we that a lot of the more severe uh, people with maybe uh, you know, bigger risk factors such as obesity or diabetes and heart disease would would get missed out on it. Uh, but I think it is changing. I think the supply is starting to ramp up a little bit. And certainly, at the IMO Irish Medical Organization made a clarification on it, which was quite useful. They said patients, you know, obviously severe asthma required oral steroids or clinically indicated. I think that's an important, that will allow us to, to offer the vaccine to a, a wider cohort of patients. Obviously, you now if somebody had a 34-year-old a healthy guy comes in who got one blue inhaler when he was 10, you know, that's not the people we want. But there are a lot of patients out there with, with brittle and asthma who's quite severe, who I think will be coming under the umbrella and will be getting the vaccine in the near future. Um, thanks a million. Um, I, I suppose that's that's reassuring to Dermot to to people to feel like it is coming and that um, you know the clinicians um, who are making these decisions and making these recommendations are bearing in mind what their real life experience is. Um, we are hearing that from patients, so it's good to know that that's for um, at the forefront of people's minds. Let's say, and um, if it's okay, I have two questions to direct uh, to to Des maybe initially, and then Marcus may have something that he wants to add in. Um, one of those, Des, is from um, somebody who has just uh, come on the system here since we've been live. Um, it's, uh, sorry, give me a second, I'll read the name in front of me. Um, it's Mary who wants to know when symptoms are arising, should a child, or in this case an adult, stay at home uh, using more inhalers or steroids, or can they go to school or work? And that's something that we might ask you to talk about uh, for the patients that you see. And the second thing is, um, we've had one question from Michelle, whose son is 11 and who has been feeling quite unwell. And at the moment, his respiratory team are considering um, a treatment that's called Zolair. Um, and so Michelle is obviously worrying about her son and how he's doing. And she just wants to know a little bit more about what that treatment means. Um, and I suppose why that might be considered um, or, or uh, what, what I suppose um, that can involve for a, a child. Yeah, um, thanks very much. Um, so just in relation to the first question, um, it, you know, whether or not your child can go to school in the middle of an asthma exacerbation, look, that's a quite a difficult, uh, you know, you can't really answer that with a one stop or one, fit, one uh, size fits all answer. In general, um, as I mentioned in my talk, in child in, in childhood asthma, most asthma attacks are caused by viruses. So, um, if your child has a, a runny nose and a cough and then develops an asthma attack, it, it you know they generally should be managed at home. Obviously, in consultation with your GP. And um, if they have a little active virus, they're likely to pass that on to 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 somebody else. So, as a general rule, you know, uh, observing them at home for a couple of days probably is the most sensible thing. Um, you know, we've all got into the habit of washing our hands and and uh, you know, in, you know, cleaning uh, cleaning surfaces uh, furiously over the past year. So, I suppose you know, these are um, you, you know, in, in, you're more likely if you have a little virus, you're more likely to pass that on to somebody else if <clears throat> if you are in the middle of a, an asthma exacerbation. For the most part, obviously, you just can't answer that question for one and all. But that's kind of what I would I would recommend. 
In regards to the second question, um, in, a, 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 in respect to Zolar or omalizumab, which is a medication which is reserved for the more uh, troublesome or more severe asthmatic category, um, it is licensed in children up uh, from the age of six onwards. So we do use it in a small percentage of children who we can't manage with um, with 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 uh, inhaled therapies or, or other oral therapies that we have available to us, um, it's it's a very safe medication uh, for the large part, and um, which as I said, it's only on a small proportion of kids in our practice here in Crumlin. But um, it certainly is something that we use from time to time, and obviously I, I would advise uh, that mom or dad to uh, have a chat with their consultant, maybe write the questions out before you uh, go to the consultation, and um, you know make sure you have all your questions answered before you embark on the therapy uh, certainly it's it's uh, you know it's it, it's it's a bit of work um you know it's monthly infusions and um it is a significant step up to what you would um normally require for your asthma treatment but it is very well validated and and is safe to use in children over the age of six for the most part Great. Um, thanks, Des. Hopefully that will provide some reassurance. I, I hasten to add that um, we we are here day in, day out to support and to, to guide patients for any of these kinds of queries. These are the kind of things that Ruth deals with on our nurse WhatsApp service and that our uh, respiratory nurse team deals with on our advice line all of the time. If any of these questions are the kind of thing you want to know about, literally pick up the phone and either text us through WhatsApp or um, uh, call us on the advice line number and we can guide and support you on any of these. And if we're not getting into a huge amount of medical detail right now, obviously um, there's only so much we can do on, on this kind of a, a broadcast or a webinar type style. And, um, you know, we're more than happy to follow up if people want to get a little bit more detail on any of the questions that they're asking. Um, if it's okay, Ruth, I might kick two questions over to you. Um, one has come in um, from somebody just since the event started and um, that's from Emma. She says she's five months pregnant and she wants to know, does the preventer have any um, effects on the baby? And one of the other lifestyle questions that's coming in um, is actually about stress or anxiety. And so uh, Joanne has asked about tips for um, asthmatics who deal with anxiety or panic attacks. And Joanne, uh, sorry, um, and Noreen has asked um, about whether constant unresolved stress has an impact on people with asthma. So I suppose that's the, the pregnancy question in terms of medication route and also uh, anxiety and panic attacks, which we do hear about very frequently from patients. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Uh, right, the first question then on pregnancy and asthma. The most important thing during pregnancy is that you continue to take your medication as prescribed um, and do discuss it with your consultant. Um, not taking your medication and making your asthma worse will actually have a, obviously have an effect on your baby and on your own health. So it is better that you take your medication and, and inhaled corticosteroids are quite safe to take during pregnancy. Um, so again, if you're, if you're not, you know, if you're concerned, do have the discussion with your GP or send us a message on WhatsApp or talk to some of our nurses as well on the advice line and they can guide you through it. So. Um, yes, I suppose the other thing about pregnancy is that asthma can either stay the same. If you have asthma, your asthma control can stay the same. It can actually get better than normal or it actually can get worse. So as your pregnancy progresses, that's how you're, you're kind of going to know that as, as things go along. But again, the most important thing is that your asthma is optimally controlled and you know using your asthma action plan. So the second question then in relation to anxiety. So anxiety is actually a big trigger for asthma and we've seen this a lot in the last year, particularly in relation to COVID. Um, but even prior to COVID, it still is, you know, it is, it is a big trigger for asthma. So, you know, if you're feeling anxious and you get, you know, the symptoms can get worse, whether it's your asthma getting worse or whether it's your anxious symptoms get coming on. And um, because they are quite similar, you know, you can feel the chest tightness with anxiety, which you also can feel with asthma, but which is it? You're not going to know that. Um, again, you know, shortness of breath can occur with both asthma and anxiety. So again, you know, keeping your asthma well controlled obviously is the best thing you can do. Using things like, you know, mindfulness apps. Mindfulness is brilliant. Even just going out for a walk and being mindful of being outside and, you know, don't have headphones in your ears and you're out walking, have been listening to nature and all that sort of thing. That actually can help as well. Just bear in mind, obviously, it has been very cold. So if you are going to walk in a cold air is a trigger for you, just be aware of that and use your snooze when you're going out. Um, so again, just download some good mindfulness apps and use them on a regular basis. Um, 
and likewise if you send us a message on whatsapp i can actually send you some links to some different mindfulness things and some breathing exercises that can help so you know there are some breathing exercises out there on on different websites and that that are very useful actually for helping with um anxiety as well and things like you know you know if you're not sleeping and that you know don't be drinking caffeine before you go to bed that might actually be keeping you awake and things like that um so again as I say, we can give you all those tips and tricks through our um, our WhatsApp service. Thanks, Ruth. Um, and just maybe to reiterate on that point, I do know when we speak to um, uh, speak to the nurses and their work across Advice Line and across the WhatsApp service, they do really try to help you as the wholeness of the patient, whether it's you as a patient or the carer um, of a patient. Um, and we do bear in mind that we are all a full human being um, and that all of these things can have a, an impact on how our body feels. So um, Ruth and the rest of the nursing team can often provide really good um, sensible pragmatic advice about you know how to manage your asthma in your whole life because we are all a patient and our whole lives surround us and parts of that can be about a trigger but also parts of it can make um, us feel a lot better um, and i have always found that really positive and nurturing from uh, the nurses when i hear them talk about that and they see how our asthma fits into our lives around us and um, i have two questions that i might kick over uh, to dermot if that's okay dermot again these are kind of lifestyle asthma management questions and I expect our part of um, uh, why Dermot gets out of bed in the morning. One of them is about what impact does hay fever have on asthma? Um, I'll preface that by saying our hay fever tracker is live extra um, early this year, thanks to support from ALK on that. Um, and we are available to support you through the hay fever season, which can be a substantial trigger for asthma. But um, Dermot might touch on how um, a hay fever can impact on asthma. And the second question um, is from Mary, and she wants to know, is it normal to have a constant cough six months after an asthma flare-up. So Dermot, you might um, uh, answer Mary and Kathy's questions there. Yeah, I think they're very good questions. Um, I think the hay fever and the rhinitis is uh, is really important. I think it's sometimes we get forgotten about. We need to remember that the, the airway starts the tip of your nose to the bottom of your alveoli in your lungs. So it's 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 a disease of the full airway. So if you have, so the, but we often forget about the nose in which we treat we treat asthma and often for patients nasal symptoms and, and runny nose and rhinitis and hay fever can be almost more troublesome than asthma um, so we need to treat it very aggressively because if your if your nasal symptoms are uncontrolled there's a good chance that your 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 lung symptoms won't be controlled uh, a couple of key messages one is you need to start your treatment before your your symptoms really get bad so usually people know when their symptoms of rhinitis starts they say it starts around june so you need to start maybe a couple of weeks beforehand with your nasal steroid to damp it down to prevent the attack getting getting worse um, and uh, antihistamines if as you know as as, as as the year goes on if needs it again starting early can can prevent the attack and um, so it's really important that we don't forget about the rhinitis and hay fever treat it aggressively and treat it early also that patients most patients you know not that we talk about patients don't use their their meter dose inhaler correctly most patients don't use their nasal sprays correctly as well they sniff in way too fast and it all it does is sends the the, the medication down the back of your throat it's a slow uh, a sniff sniff like a rabbit they say you know uh, barely up the, up the nose um, uh, and that'll keep the the medication in your nose point it to the side of your away from what you'd naturally think your nose is in the middle point it to the other side of it to try and control symptoms so rhinitis uh, and it's worth we do we we often allergy test these and there is newer treatments that can uh, improve people's quality of life because um, and we're coming into you know exam season we know that people with with hay fever they they perform their performance in exams falls so that's that's important so i would say hay fever and rhinitis is really important part of it um, Constant, the cough six months after an attack doesn't sound again obviously it's, we, that's a whole different thing but I, th I think you'd need to look at other symptoms are you is your asthma under control are you using the right medication i think maybe to look at other things maybe rhinitis 
reflux. We see a lot of maybe where your acid in your tummy is, is, is irritating your lungs. Um, there's a whole spectrum. But I think it's worth following up with your, 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 your GP or specialist to see that that, that, that is not normal for, your, for your, uh, the cough six months after an attack. Either they, you know, there's other things. You may be on other medications like April, some of the blood pressure tablets can cause it, chronic cough. It's worth having a full review of your symptoms, I think. Um, and obviously, if you're a smoker, you need to stop smoking. Um, we know that about, you know, about you know, 50 to 20 percent of patients with asthma continue to smoke or, or the family members. So there's a, it's a whole load of things in it. I'd say it's not normal. It's worth getting that followed up. Um, great, Jermish. Um, I, I think I'll remember the sniff like a rabbit one. That's quite interesting. I've certainly heard clinicians talk about the importance of directing uh, the nasal spray to the outer side of the nose, but sniff like a rabbit is a new one. Um, so if anybody asks me any questions at home, I'll just explain that Dermot has told me to do it and that it's absolutely fine. Um, but it, it's very good, I think, to include that conversation about um, allergic rhinitis and its relationship to asthma, because when we speak to patients about quality of life and how they feel, often the allergies piece is as big or bigger than the um, the asthma piece and I suppose one of the things if there's any healthcare professionals whether they're consultants, uh, GPs, nurses and um, physicians and um, pharmacists uh, dialed in and listening we really would love for you to ask that one extra question which is and what about the nose because patients get a bit embarrassed about the snot and they get really used to the fact that actually um, they, they've always had a bad nose or they've always had a runny nose and actually sometimes it really takes a healthcare professional to say well what about it and how does it make you feel for a patient to feel able to say well actually it really makes me feel quite lousy and then for um, us to have a really good patient healthcare professional relationship that allows it to move on and I say that from personal experience because when I got my allergies under control I don't want to tell you how much better I felt in my life in myself which is um, I think important for all of us and um, just maybe to touch back on a few of the extra questions we have two or three here that um, are uh, perhaps a little bit more orientated to some of the healthcare professionals who dialed in. So we'll take those together. Um, I'll kick them over to Marcus, but it may be that somebody else has um, something that they want to say on them afterwards. So um, I'll, I'll see what, um, what your perspective is on it, Marcus. So there's a question from Margie who wants to know um, about why the Asthma Society uh, don't advocate and take on board the Boteco, um, uh method, which is, I know, about breathing exercises. And Marcus, you might explain that. And the second one is from Mary, who wants to know um, uh, the, the view of the panel on the role of immunotherapy in asthma. So both of those quite interesting. And Marcus, maybe for the benefit of some of the patients who mightn't maybe know some of the technicalities behind either of those two concepts, would you explain those? Would that be okay? Sure. Yeah, so uh, yeah, it's an excellent question. Very informed again. The Buteco method is uh, it's been around for a long time. Uh, it's a, a Russian specialist who actually uh, came up with this back in the 50s. Um, and, and the concept behind it is, is laudable and does make sense, um, which is uh, trying to um, avoid hyperventilation, which is breathing too rapidly. Um, you know, the, the, the idea that some, some, sometimes during panic attacks, people you know, breathe so rapidly they can actually start to pass out. But, the, but it also makes sense, in, in, uh, at least in theory, in, in asthma where you have narrowed tubes that if you don't blow, uh, you know, um, breathe too quickly, you, you, breathing too quickly can overinflate the lungs. So the principle of Buteco is, is relaxation and, and nasal breathing and, and deliberately pausing in between a breath in and then breath out so that there's longer time for breath to escape i mean it's it's a sensible thing that the difficulty that uh, international organizations have and hence national organizations like our own in in approving it across the board is comes back to the science that we just don't have good enough science uh, to show uh, that it is um, helpful enough for for a lot of time to be spent dealing with it but the principles of it are are, are good i mean something not a million miles away is pursed lipped breathing which is you know tightening the lips during exhalation when one feels a little bit uh, overinflated and that just slows down the exhalation time to allow air to escape before a new intake of air and in general the relaxation aspect of buteco is a laudable thing it's good for asthma patients it's good for everybody to to uh, have more relaxation in our life and it does certainly help uh, with, with symptoms in that sense um, we're, so asthma doctors are not against it but we find it harder to uh, advocate it without a stronger evidence base. Much like anything that we that we advocate, it's hugely based on trust. So we need to be able to point to the science that that supports our position. Um, the the second question, uh, I'm just trying to remember what the second question was. I blanked on it there. What was it again, Sarah? It was around the role of immunotherapy. Um, oh, thank uh, you, pardon. 
So yeah, so immunotherapy has also been around for quite a while. Uh, it, the, the forerunner was the injection uh, allergy shots, as they've been called, which have been widely used by allergists. Um, and more recently, uh, um, and more widely applicable, perhaps, would be uh, sublingual immunotherapy, which are formulated preparations from the pharmaceutical world uh, of um, uh, extracts of allergens, or these molecules that cause reaction when inhaled. And certainly for um, hay fever sufferers who have a grass allergy and who are running into trouble uh, with the typical medications used or who are trying to avoid um, the, the use of uh, the, some of the more conventional uh, hay fever medications, the use of a tablet under the tongue on a daily basis for about three years can uh, favorably impact on the likelihood of further hay fever in the years that follow. Uh, so in other words, it seems to improve and lessen the likelihood of those symptoms uh, being as bad or recurring after you've finished your three-year uh, course of treatment. But there's the, the devil in the detail. You need to adhere to this for three years. And if you don't adhere tightly to it, it's less effective. Um, the injection shots had a bad name for quite a while because these are concoctions often that are institution specific made in a particular organization rather than widely standardized across the pharmaceutical industry. And there were some uh, well noted deaths caused by uh, life threatening and fatal uh, allergic reaction to in some instances that that uh, set back that area. But that was, you know, three decades ago and at this stage the uh, tablet uh, immunotherapy I think is going to uh, offer the best way forward for it but it doesn't work so well if you don't address all the allergens so if you try to take this under the tongue but you don't address something else you're allergic to you won't get a good re result and you know, importantly in asthma um, it could actually aggravate asthma the exception to this perhaps and it's on its way now is the uh, the house dust mite preparation so for patients who are sensitized purely to the house dust mite and not to other allergens and who have significant hay fever type allergic rhinitis symptoms that are is perennial all year round and who have mild or moderate asthma there may be some benefit from again a three-year course of treating uh, this uh, with, with this tablet and it's not a dangerous thing uh, dangerous reactions are extraordinarily rare um, and although the first dose should be administered in a doctor's office So I'll hand back to Sarah there. Thanks. Thanks. I mean, I I, um, I, I note we're running fairly close to the time. Um, if it's okay, I just have, I have two questions that I might um, kick over to Des for us to answer uh, very briefly, and then I'll try to stick uh, very closely to time, if that's okay. Uh, Des, the two questions here were, um, are there any new treatments in terms of severe asthma? Um, and you might answer that in respect uh, of uh, pediatric asthma, obviously. And the second thing is, can asthma get worse when you get older? And I think you might have an interesting perspective on that, because I know asthma being an early onset uh, disease can can mean that it's um i suppose we feel it feeds into sometimes it's not taken very seriously and it's dismissed so you might have a perspective on that yeah um so in regards to the first question uh on whether or not there are any new treatments for asthma in in regards to mild to moderate not particularly um there are uh, obviously improvements and advances in in some medications but by and large as i mentioned in my talk still the cornerstone rests at the door of uh, inhaled steroids so your your brown inhaler your orange inhaler your purple inhaler whichever one it is in regards to newer medications there are a lot of uh, what what is called uh, biological uh, biologic therapies uh, they these are more reserved for the more severe asthmatics and um, they there, there has been significant advancements in, in regards to different uh, biologic treatments, uh, but again, they they were only represent a very small proportion, and there's no evidence that they have a, a dramatic impact on mild to moderate cases of asthma, and they're generally reserved for children who have more severe asthma. So, in that respect, you know, there are um, there are advances in in the area of pediatric asthma, but not necessarily in the mild to moderate cases. Um, so then in the second question about uh, asthma and what, what happens over time in, in childhood. Um, so, uh, you know, as I mentioned in my talk again, asthma can occur at any age during childhood. And it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be two, three, four to get to get a diagnosis. Um, I, I suppose uh, there are different time points uh, where you can grow out of it. So, you know, most research would indicate that um, children who wheeze in the first, in the toddler years or the preschool years, about two thirds of them would grow out of it by the time they reach five or six. 
Um, however, there, are, there is a smaller percentage who have allergic or atopic asthma is what we call it, and they tend to have asthma throughout their childhood, and that can be quite troublesome. Um, in regards to can it get worse, uh, it, it certainly uh, allergy and uh, other uh, kind of triggers can become more prominent as they get older, so, so that can make it more troublesome. So your asthma can evolve over time. Um, but um, yeah, it, 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 it is a variable um, in, across patients groups some children just get asthma whenever they get a virus and they don't get sick otherwise but then there are another percentage of kids who develop different types of asthma and that does evolve into you know <clears throat> throughout their teenage years and into adulthood thanks des um, i suppose that kind of conveys some of the complexity of it in that um this is not a, 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 a simple one sentence answer uh, for patients. They all often have a very different experience. Um, Marcus, just maybe if you wouldn't mind just touching on that, um, as in it's not 100% clear to me for uh, what age the, the person asking the question was. So they may have been asking in relation to children, but they may have also been asking in relation to adults. And certainly we find that it can be challenging for people who are diagnosed as um, adults to accept that diagnosis and also to understand when they think, you know, that asthma is actually really um, linked to childhood and not to adults. Yeah, um, so that means that the diagnosis uh, has to be made correctly. Uh, it requires uh, a test of um, airflow, expiratory airflow in order for it to be robust. And oftentimes misdiagnosis is because we haven't been able to get that piece of diagnosis correct with pulmonary function testing or with uh, repeated measures of peak flow, etc., over a long period of time showing excessive variability. Um, the data for, uh, such as it is, um, probably the, some of the best quality data on growing out of asthma, if you like, in adulthood, um, uh, compared with childhood, was an Italian study that was uh, published in recent years um, in the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology, or JACI, which is a, a very high, highly ranked journal. Um, and it showed that, um, I think this was about 18,000 patients were involved, both uh, adults and children followed up for uh, uh, several years. It showed that for the pediatric group, 65% um, roughly of patients um, uh, grew out of their uh, asthma, you know, two years later on no medication, had no return of their symptoms. Whereas in the adult onset group, which was defined as those who develop symptoms at the age of 20 or onwards, um, the rate of growing out of your symptoms and not needing any treatment for two whole years on, you know, uh, a follow-up was only in 15, one five percent of patients. So 85% did not have that uh, ability to stay asthma free off treatment for two years. Um, so it, it is a diagnosis for the long haul in the vast majority of cases when made in adulthood. Um, I mean, another study followed up patients proactively on no treatment who decided not to take treatment for their asthma. And it was uh, not even as, as good as that last study in terms of the, the, the figures being reassuring in that 95% uh, of patients had a return of asthma symptoms within the two years of follow up and 5% remained symptom free. So it's, it's important uh, that we help patients to accept the diagnosis and the need to be on controller therapy to avoid bad outcomes. I'll hand, you back, hand it back. Thanks, Marcus. I suppose that means, um, uh, you know, that's something we try to bear in mind always about um, how we can best support patients um, when they've been diagnosed to really understand the condition, but also to really accept the diagnosis, which can be challenging sometimes. I mean, I'm aware of the fact that we probably have about another 10 or 15 questions, but we really want to stick to time because we know when people are very good to, to uh, support us by giving us the, um, uh, their time and their energy, we don't want to uh, take advantage of saying, I suppose what I'd like to do, first of all, is to say thank you to GSK for supporting this conference. Uh, for us, asthma management is what we try to do day in, day out. And it's fantastic uh, to have something like this where people can engage with this and can learn more from their own homes or from their workplaces, depending on whether they're, they're dialed in as healthcare professionals or as patients, or sometimes as both. Um, it's really fantastic um, to get the opportunity during Asthma Awareness Week to, to talk like this, to hear different perspectives. And we're sorry about the technical issues earlier that meant we couldn't hear from people as much as we would have liked. Um, I think really there's an awful lot of food for thought in, in what we've heard today. And um, for us, uh, we've just come out of a very challenging 15 or 16 months. Um, I, I mean, many of your, uh, many of you who are listening will be aware of the fact that it's been phenomenally challenging for virtually every charity. But for us as a respiratory ch charity, as a patient support group, we pulled out all the stops to support patients in the last 15 months, but we're finding it challenging. So 
if it's so often you will have noticed a little ticker on the bottom of the screen asking if you could consider donating to the asthma society and um, it would be really wonderful if you could go to the website and click on the donate button and support our work and um, we are concerned it's it's been a very challenging 15 months and we are concerned about whether we can retain our services and um, some of those look um look at risk um frankly and that's uh, that's not drama that's real um in terms of what we're having to consider so um any support you can offer is great and obviously um financial support is brilliant for us but also you being out there being an advocate talking about asthma making other people aware of it helping people to understand more about it is also incredibly valuable um for us and for all of the people you've heard from today that's part of they want everybody to be able to know the five step rule to recognize when somebody's feeling worse uh, to have the basics of asthma management to know their triggers inside and outside in the way that um, a number of the people today have talked about um, so thank you for your time for dialing in and thank you to all of our speakers who've given generously of their time uh, to give us their insight and their thinking about how we can improve asthma management and um, uh, again um, obviously as i've mentioned throughout our uh, um, explicit direct patient to patient services um, on the asthma advice line on 1800 44 54 64 and on the nurse whatsapp line which you'll have seen coming up in the ticker which is on 086 you can send a whatsapp message to that and um, we're here to help you and um, we we like to do that we love to do that so um, you can rely on us um, uh, to be here to support you um, but also we have things like we have a children's hub on our website and um, we have um, inhaler tech Technique videos as Ruth mentioned and um, uh, we have lots of videos from patients talking about their experience and um, speaking to uh, one of the points um, uh, that the speakers made earlier about the expert patients we have a lot of expert patients who uh, give us their time and their energy to help people um, and we're here to help if there's other things that you think we should be doing please do email us like we, we always want to hear that from patients but um, I suppose we also ask a little bit for your patience in how you deal with us because um, we're really having to pick and choose what we can do on your behalf at the moment and um, uh, given our resourcing and our staffing and um, uh, do bear with us as we try to do our best in in a very busy time and um, but thank you again for your time and uh, during asthma awareness week maybe you might just take one action which would be to share the five step rule um, with one group um, of uh, your friends on WhatsApp or on Viber um, or even just text it on to one friend or family member to make sure that they know about what to do if somebody's having a serious asthma attack and um, even that would be a, a really lovely endeavour for people to undertake and thank you again for your time.